Welcome to the Heart and Lung Research Podcast, a window into the world of research at Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals. In this episode, we will be speaking to Dr. John Wirt, a consultant in pulmonary hypertension and intensive care medicine. I'll be asking him about his research into pulmonary hypertension and the research that's been carried out into the disease. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Wirt. Can you briefly introduce yourself and tell us how you got into researching this particular condition? Yeah, okay. My name is John Wirt and I'm a physician. Uh, I trained as a respiratory and intensive care physician. I initially started out doing chemistry at university and soon into that I decided I wanted to do medicine. Went to London to University College Hospital to study medicine and then whilst I was doing clinical training I did a PhD and it was at that time that I became interested in pulmonary hypertension. Tim Evans, who was the professor of the intensive care unit at that time, said that uh, the money's in pulmonary hypertension, son, and you should research into that. So that's what my PhD became, and the rest is history. For those of us who aren't completely familiar with the condition, do you mind just explaining briefly what pulmonary hypertension is and how it develops? Pulmonary hypertension means high blood pressure in the lungs. The right side of the heart, the right ventricle, pumps blood into the lungs, and when the pressure rises the right side of the heart, the right ventricle struggles and eventually fails, a sort of right ventricular failure. And at that point, patients start developing symptoms such as breathlessness and and swelling of their legs and, and tummy. So pulmonary hypertension itself isn't particularly rare. Patients with lung diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or or lung fibrosis quite often uh, get pulmonary hypertension. But the rarer forms are the ones that uh, we have some specific treatments for, and they're the ones that I see in my practice. There are five groups of pulmonary hypertension, and they're grouped like that because they have similar mechanisms of why they develop and also anticipated responses to treatment. So group one is one of the rare groups, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we're looking in terms of prevalence, so about 50 cases per million of the population in the country, so a rare condition. Within that, there's a condition called idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. Idiopathic meaning we don't really know why people get it. The incidence of that is one or two cases per million, so that's new cases per million per year. And overall, the prevalence of that condition is around 15 cases per million. So we're talking about a very rare condition. Then there's group 2, which is pulmonary hypertension due to left-sided heart disease. That is very common, but the treatment of that is the underlying cause of the left-sided heart disease, not specific treatments. Group 3 is pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, as I've mentioned before with COPD and and lung fibrosis, again fairly common. Group 4 is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and so that's another one of these rare conditions. Patients who have blood clots in the lung, pulmonary emboli, normally recover when they're given blood thinners such as warfarin. However, in a small group of patients, the clots don't disappear properly and scars form. And we're talking about four patients in 100, say, who have had pulmonary emboli over a two-year period. And then there's a fifth group, which is a kind of a mixed bag of different types of conditions that can affect lots of organs in the body, such as sarcoidosis, for instance. I think it's important to say that in the group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension, there is a a sex difference so that uh, women are much more common than than men. But that's not necessarily so in in the other forms of pulmonary hypertension. I was always under the impression that heart-related conditions are usually more common in men than in women. So what you're saying is that more women are affected than men for this particular type of pulmonary hypertension. Is there a reason for that? There has to be a reason, but unfortunately we don't really know completely at the moment. The most likely reason is that there is a susceptibility of cells to the female hormones such as oestrogen. And there are some studies in the labs that would suggest that that's true, that if cells such as the cells lining the blood vessels are exposed to oestrogen or changes in oestrogen, then they become more likely to proliferate or increase in number and therefore make the the cell walls uh, thicker. So it's something to do with that, but we haven't fully defined it as yet. What are some of the treatments currently available for the disease? Treatment will depend on the type of pulmonary hypertension. So that's why those pulmonary hypertension groups are classified as they are. Pulmonary hypertension that we deal with in the national specialised services are group 1, the pulmonary arterial hypertension, and the group 4, pulmonary hypertension due to blood clots, the chronic thromboembolic disease. 
In group 1, the pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the blood vessels have become thickened and narrowed, there are drugs called pulmonary vasodilators, meaning they open up the blood vessels. And those are the drugs that we're using now, and drugs such as sildenafil or Viagra are one of the most common drugs that we give to patients, which causes much amusement in the clinic. And they open up the blood vessels. They don't address the thickening of the blood vessels, but they do dilate the blood vessels and therefore help the blood flow more freely and take the pressure off the right side of the heart. For the group 4 disease, the pulmonary hypertension due to chronic thromboembolic disease, then the treatment of choice is actually surgery, pulmonary endarterectomy. And this is where the scars that are formed are removed at surgery. It's obviously a very large operation uh, and it's only performed in Papworth in this country. So our trust is a designated national centre for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. What does that mean exactly? Early on in in, in the 2000s, there were a group of physicians and centres that had an interest in a history and researching these rare conditions. And it was felt that the centres that had an interest should become designated centres, if you like, so that they could manage the small number of patients and, and put in all the expertise of managing patients as well as possible. The the treatments that we have now are also very expensive and so the government, the commissioners, only commission the centres to be able to prescribe these expensive and difficult to deliver medications. So that's what it means to, to be a designated centre where we're allowed to prescribe the medication and give these difficult medications to these rare group of patients. Okay, so let's move on to research now. What are some of the projects that you're working on at the moment? The kind of research I, I do is, is a real mixture, actually. So I'm interested in basic research, lab work. I've got a team and I collaborate with a lot of people. And then there are the pharmaceutical industry-led studies that, that we take part in. And there are also some national studies. One of those is the most important, the National Cohort Study. And that's taking all the patients that are referred to the national centres with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So that's where we don't know the exact underlying cause. And also a related condition called heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension, where we know that there is an underlying family history. And and we're collecting all the patients and we're following them over time. And we're collecting DNA samples and blood samples. And we're we're measuring how they exercise. We're also looking at the family members as well, patients who potentially have the chance of developing the condition. So we want to work out what might cause pulmonary arterial hypertension because you obviously don't just need the gene. We know that even if you have the gene, you've only got a sort of 20% chance of developing the condition. So there must be other things that happen that you get exposed to. And this study will help us to understand those. Part of the DNA work in it means that we've already discovered four new genes. And, and that's really important because by understanding how those genes are going wrong and what proteins are involved, we'll be able to develop new drugs against new targets. Would you say that for pulmonary hypertension we're still in the early stages of genetic research? Well we've known about the main gene that's involved in the familial cases it's called bone morphogenetic protein receptor 2 a bit of a mouthful we've known that since the early 2000s and yet I suppose we haven't really developed any treatments based on it. But only now, I think, are we looking at understanding how we can use this information to develop new treatment. I noticed that some of the research studies that you're currently working on involve testing drugs that are already on the market for other conditions. Would you say that there's a move within the research community to try and repurpose existing drugs? I think that's always attractive because it takes at least 10 years, doesn't it, to develop a drug from the lab to taking it through to man. I think that's still the case now. So it's always attractive to try and repurpose drugs. And we took part in a a national study recently called Transform UK, which was looking at an antibody therapy, an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody that's used in rheumatoid arthritis. And we knew that certain cytokines, these are proteins in the blood that are involved in inflammation, are high in patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we know that if the levels are high, patients don't do so well. So it seemed to be a good idea to actually uh, see whether the antibody against IL-6 would help in these patients. Now, the study's finished, but we're waiting to see the results. So um, we'll have to have a follow-up podcast to tell you about that. And then there are some simple other drugs that are used in different conditions that are always coming up as potential. So I think it is important that repurposing is very important because it can be done quite quickly. And we know also that drugs are, are safe, generally safe. And where do you see pulmonary hypertension research heading towards in, say, the next 10 to 15 years? At present, all the treatments that we're using now are these pulmonary phasodilators. They're involved in opening up the blood vessels. They're not addressing the thickening of the blood vessels. We call that remodeling. 
So there are some drugs that are being looked at now, which I think in the next five to 10 years will be coming through into clinical practice. Probably one of the most exciting things is that we will be doing precision medicine, so tailoring the treatment to the patient much better. So I've already mentioned about genes. So if we know, for instance, that there's a particular gene defect, then we will be using the treatments that seem to work when that gene defect is there. I think we'll have a much more personalised approach to medicine and also I think in terms of research we'll have a whole new lot of medications that are involved in reversing and preventing the remodelling that's happening in these small blood vessels. Thank you very much Dr Wirt for taking the time to speak with us today and thank you for listening. If you'd like to find out more about the research being carried out at Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust, please visit our webpages at www.rbht.nhs.uk forward slash research.